This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today we've got a special guest on the podcast. His name is Norman Stone. So he is a film and television producer and director. He is a two-time Emmy Award winner and a BAFTA Award winner. If you're not familiar with BAFTA, that is the British Academy of Film and Television and Arts. And he's also the writer and director of a film, a film that I just saw recently that's fantastic. It's called The Most Reluctant Convert, The Untold Story of C.S. Lewis. And so obviously, if you're listening to this, uh, I'm releasing this episode along with the episode that is the star of that particular film. And that is an actor named Max McClellan lane. And so you can listen to these one or the other. It's not really going to matter. I'm asking both of them similar questions. I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit, but it's a very, very interesting time period to be in the year 2022. And yet there's so many people around the globe that are becoming interested in a guy named C.S. Lewis for the first time, right? They're reading his writings from, you know, darn near a hundred years ago. And they're, they're centering some of their ideologies and theology and different things around his writings. And again, guys, as I point out, uh, you know, fairly often we have a book list on our website, the 100 books, every modern Christian man should read list. Now there's different categories, right? There's apologetics, there's Christian, there's money, there's, you know, marriage, there's philosophy, all kinds of things. But there is a particular author that has his own entire section and that's C.S. Lewis. He's the only author that has his own section in there. And that's because I I think so highly of his writings and what they can do for most Christians. And I'm not even, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia aren't even on there. But in this interview with Norman, you know, we talk about how we got into kind of this entire world of doing film and doing television and those different things. Because at one point he was the youngest uh, producer and director for the BBC, which is just fantastic and a unique feather that he could have in his cap. But then we talk about why the public is so interested in C.S. Lewis, you know, why he's worked on so many other projects, not just The Most Reluctant Convert, but he did a lot of projects before this about C.S. Lewis and his life. And he even told us, you know, something that a week ago he wouldn't have been able to tell us. And I'll kind of save that for the actual show it kind of talks about some things that he's going to be doing in the future in terms of what he was doing with C.S. Lewis or some things that have to do with C.S. Lewis. But man, I really enjoyed my time with him. I got to speak a little bit uh, with him and, you know, I think, uh, you know, his wife or somebody was in there helping him beforehand with the video and it was, it was just fun. I mean, I didn't have a whole long time with this guy, but you know, his family was going to be coming by and they were going to be having a big dinner. So I got to talk to him about that off air and we got to speak a little bit about scotch and some different things. And so a very, very unique interview, but I couldn't be more pleased with how it turned out. So I'm glad to bring it to you guys. So without further ado, Let's get into it. Norman Stone, welcome to Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Very good to be here and just learning all about it. Very good. Yeah, absolutely. I will tell you, we had a lovely conversation off here. I have to say lovely because, you know, you're you know kind of English and you got to say things like that. But uh, let's kind of go in. I want to make sure my audience has a good idea of who you are before we dig into the meat of what we're going to be talking about. My understanding is, is that you began your professional career in television as yeah. the youngest producer and director to be working for the BBC. So That's that at least at the, at the time, they paid me little enough, so it must be true. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess, you know, for most of us, we're not in that world of directing film and television. So what drew you to that world? And I guess, how'd you get into it? Um, my grandfather told me a story when I was three years old, sat me on his knee and he's to blame. I saw pictures. And I've never understood still how that works. If you te- say even just one sentence, a very visual sentence, as we'd call it, you see a picture without a screen, without anything in between you and the grandfather's mouth. And I can still remember that story. He was a lovely Christian guy. He'd made up this little parable. He told me stories from then on in. And I just looked at his mouth and saw pictures. And it was fantastic. I can now remember that many, many, many years later, that whole story, because I saw the pictures. I mean, that's just incredible. And so for a lot of us, we, you were kind of captured by the magic, it seems like, of all of those things. But then they still don't say, hey, I want to do that. Like, I want to get paid to do that type of thing. So uh, what steps did you take, I guess, to kind of make that a reality? I dreamt a lot. Um, no, what, what basically happens is you think, can I really get paid for something I'd really pay them to let me do? And right. occasionally you come across things that say, yes, you can. Um, So I went to seven years of art college, including four years of film and TV, and got out of that with an MA and other stuff, and was fortunate enough to have uh, have met Eric Clapton uh, to do with a story on heroin addiction and a treatment for it uh, that really works, and the BBC liked that, so I pitched it, 
uh, I, I'd met some people in the BBC and I said, how did my pitch go? Let me see. It said, Eric Clapton, Eric Clapton, Eric Clapton. And, and they said yes. And right. the weird thing was, uh, I, he wasn't in the film when I made it. It was It's something that still works and no one's noticing, but it's a great. it was a great film and a great idea. And when they saw the film, because I'd learned through seven hard years how to make films a bit, uh, they gave me a job and that went on from there. Well, that is, that's incredible. So I, I guess, how'd you get connected with Eric Clapton? Because I, it's funny enough, like he was a guy that obviously my parents kind of listened to, but I remember in college reading his autobiography and I didn't know anything about him, the man, but you know, the story about his son, you know, falling out of that, that window yeah. and just the drug addiction and kind of what it was like growing up for him. Like, of course I had no idea. I was completely naive. So, so how did y'all two uh, get well, connected with his you, story? Which, which biography did you read? If you read it, I suspect it wouldn't be this one, but this was the one written by a very good friend of mine, a Christian guy called Steve. Turner, who writes for Rolling Stone and things as well. Uh, and his was Conversations with Eric Clapton. I met him because I met a filmmaker, an older guy, an older Scottish guy, and argued with him with for, for hours at this conference. And we really enjoyed ourselves. He said, come home and meet the wife. And, the, and then I said, well, where? I was living in central London. And he said, well, Harley Street. And for those who don't know, Harley Street is a very expensive medical expert street. And I thought he was joking. So I said, come on, where do you really live? And he said, no, come on round. And I went round and his wife was an award-winning, MBE award-winning Scottish surgeon for charity Christian hospitals. And uh, Eric was coming off in their front room, just plugged into this little device. And uh, I didn't know it was Eric Clapton. I said, I had a nice chat with him and left. It was a Sunday. I was off to church after that. My girlfriend at the time said, that was Eric Clapton. And I said, no, it wasn't. Calm yourself. I know what Eric right. Clapton looks like, you know. Right. You have the thin uh, cheekbones and the, oh, this guy was had let himself go. He was down to selling his last guitar. And Pete Townsend knew about Meg Patterson, and he said, "Go and stay with this lady. She can get you off in five days, ten days. It was then, I think, without withdrawals." And and it worked, and it did, and that kicked off my career. That's incredible. Yeah, the the book that I I read was actually his autobiography uh, that would have came out, you know, in the early two thousands or whatever. So it was kind of refreshing. Like I always like reading biographies where people don't try to make themselves out to be the hero because it's like I can actually believe what you're saying because it's like if you always come out looking squeaky clean and how you always made the right call, it's like I don't know if I can really trust you. Now the funny thing about uh, what you do and what you do for a living, obviously it's a very sexy kind of job. It's a job that a lot of people think <laughs> that they want. But here's the thing is they think that because they don't do it for a living. Like it seems fun. It seems like a, a lot of fun. So I'm sure that leads to a lot of big misconceptions. So I guess if you could set the record straight for a lot of us normal people, you know, what are the biggest misconceptions about being a producer or a director or even an, an actor in the film industry? I guess that if you want to make the right sort of films, they rarely pay you enough. Um, it, it can become a career to earn money. Uh, it can be I, I'm afraid I don't have much faith in the Christian industry because there they make it squeaky clean again as well. But if you make the right, truthful, moving films, you rarely get paid enough, but you influence more people. So let's talk about right films because, uh, you know, every actor especially towards the end of their career, they look back on their career and you as the consumer can very easily identify their blockbusters, their big hits, the things they're known for. Maybe they got a big award for it or something like that. But then when you ask them, what was your favorite thing? If you could leave one thing for humanity, what would it be and why? It's usually something that's kind of off the wall or something that maybe a lot of people didn't see. Like, I guess, help me understand why it is that way. Cause I understand we have to have the silly superhero movies that are, you know, it's the same, you know, storyline rinsed and repeated, but with a lot more, computer graphics this time why is it that the, the right films as you call it are, are so hard to make and thus don't really lead to you know uh, a lot of production on the the financial side for a lot of people how, how can i put that and answer what is that word again oh yeah money money right yeah i could have guessed it there yeah. you go if people want to make profits and listen there's nothing wrong with making profits off uh various sorts of films there are some films i wouldn't want to get involved with at all but there's uh there's nothing wrong with make wanting to make money it's an industry but with the secret thing about filmmaking, if you think about it, is that you get to talk to people. You get to talk to their hearts or their minds or their imaginations. And if you can do it true and with craft and with um, a skill of filmmaking and invent stuff rather than just make it a third version, fourth version, fifth version of something you saw last week, um, you can actually talk to people and they listen. And, I, you know, what? cutting to the chase, this is my phrase. I think with film and with television usually, 
You can make people feel so much they can't help but think. And that'll do me. That's that's fine for me. Make people feel so much they can't help but think. And that is a contribution. It's not just a taking the money and run. It's a contribution to society, to them, to yourself, your own heart often. And, it, and it's great fun. I do enjoy uh, when I do get paid, I get paid for, for doing something that I just love. So, hey. Well, I think you're adding authenticity, but you're also adding a heft to someone's life. So you could read a children's book or you could read, you know, a theology book and it's going to have some heft. And just because something's difficult to slog through does not mean it's negative. It's the exact opposite. It's usually positive. Uh, One kind of random question about uh, the film industry before we move in uh, to what we mainly want to spend our time talking about today. Obviously, you've worked in the UK film industry, film and television industry, and then there's what we do in the US. So it's usually centralized in Hollywood, but because of taxation and some of the crazy is going on in the state of California right now in our country, we're, we see some other places popping up, even in my home state of Oklahoma. There are a lot of people making films there. But from your perspective, what are the biggest differences between uh, making films and television in the UK versus the United States? Um, I, I have, I've made lots of films in the United States, but it's making them for Britain, uh, which is a different thing. I right. couldn't believe there was a whole country out there that spoke my own language. And then Oscar Wilde goes, uh, goes and calls us two countries separate, separated by the same language. And it's always it's true, but I loved it. And I, I made documentaries. I've done other stuff there over there as well, done films of drama and so on. Uh, and places like China I've been to and done things like that too. The difference is, I think, certainly in television, um, British television has traditionally been more, well, much deeper. It, it, the BBC does not take commercials. Uh, it concentrates and it always was really pushing the, the audience and engaging with them. That is going under the push of money and uh, light entertainment rather than heavy entertainment. That's drifting away. In America, television sells soap and other things. And really, you, you, you turn to Netflix and the streamers, don't you? That's what you do if you want to have sure. something here. As far as film itself goes, we're a very small country, but we have really interesting actors and we have really interesting stories that people don't come across. I've just read a script. Uh, they're interested in wanting to know if I'm interested in about the Vikings and the Dane law when they were taking over Britain. Mm. It's a bit too Americanized uh, a script, and I'm not surprised at that, but the stuff that's there, if you do it in the right way, can go around the world. So much of your big stories in American film, and I'm not talking about DC comics, uh, I'm saying are at the heart of things uh, internationally because they've they've got this extra edge and we're not just doing, hey, let's have another superhero. We don't Mm -hmm. have superheroes, you may have noticed. Uh, We have Boris Johnson was far from that. Well, we don't have to get into the politics of what's going on in the UK right now, although I, we should probably uh, do that again. But I would rather do that over there at a pub where we can actually talk about Yay. it, maybe yell and scream and have a good time. But we need to talk about The Most Reluctant Convert, The Untold Story of C.S. Lewis. So that is a film that you have out right now that you were the director of. And b- before we really get into the film, I was interested to learn as I was researching before this podcast that this is not the first time that you've worked on a project that was centered on the life and work in- of C.S. Lewis, right? So can you tell us about some of those other projects and I guess how did you become so generally interested in the works of C.S. Lewis who I find to be one of the most not only entertaining but thought-provoking uh you know Christian writers uh, of all time not just since the 20th century well it was a long time ago when that actually happened I and, and I'll tell you what happened I left the I worked for the BBC as their youngest director or whatever for about five years and I left long before you were born and I, I'm still waiting to be 17, by the way. I, I want to get that straight already. <laughs> okay. The, the, the idea was that you went freelance, and freelance means you've got to have somebody who wants to pay you money to make the films that you want to make, which is an interesting right. possibility. And I came – I'd just done a film. Okay, you asked. I'll tell you. I just did a film about a blind and deaf Cornish poet who was a Christian, uh, and he was an amazing character, and I dramatized his life, and it was – moving and it got an award and i realized why that people like this so much Hmm. was that this guy had earned the right to be heard so he when he spoke you listen this guy had been blind and deaf for 25 years when i met him and he was still closer to god than anyone i've ever ever met Hmm. but he had earned the right to be heard and as i went freelance i thought whoa who else do i know that has earned the right to be heard and it took me about two seconds to think c.s lewis 
Right. And the Shadowlands story, which everyone knows about, is his relationship with Joy Davidman. He marries her. She gets cancer. She gets better. She gets cancer. She dies. Doesn't sound a good pitch, but it was a good one. I did the first one of those. So I invented the original Shadowlands. He had earned the right to be heard. It got BAFTAs. It got Emmys. It got all these things. Launched my career. So I've always been interested in that. My, sorry, I'm in an office and this is uh, talking. Hang on. I'll just turn it off. No um, worries. Uh, so I'll say that again. So I've always been interested in C.S. Lewis since then, obviously. And basically, we have a huge growing interest in C.S. Lewis in Britain, but it's nothing like the growing interest in America. And I did a film with um, about the... Um, Michael Ward wrote a book called uh, Planet Narnia, and it was all about Narnia being having a, a hidden layer about the planets and this sort of thing, and it's great. It's good, and I did that. That was a documentary drama. I also did something beyond Narnia, which was a story of C.S. Lewis's life from a different twist. We did that mm -hmm. one. And whenever you do it, whatever the film is like, and I hope they were good, people are really fascinated. This is the guy that wrote that wrote Narnia. This is the guy that was X, Y, and Z. They know all about him. So when we started doing the first one of these films, because I'm hoping to do two more, hoping mm. it will be a trilogy, um, we went to his, ho his house, his home, his college. It's all there still. And we did a drama. And my crew, who'd just been working with Kenneth Branagh, who does the Poirot feature films, and Belfast came out recently. He, one of his crews worked with me on it. And the crews were really excited by yep. being actually where Lewis wrote Narnia, actually where he lived. Actually, it goes right across the board. He's interesting to people. He, again, earns the right to be heard. And when we finished that, and it was during lockdown, we were about the only film filming during lockdown, everyone was safe at the end of it, and it came out. And I expected it to make a, a, a little impact. I didn't expect it to become the second most viewed cinema film in the whole of America, which it did. And wow. when I was told that, I thought they were joking. Six days later, I still thought they were joking until they showed mm -hmm. me the figures. And that is nothing necessarily to do with the film at all, though I hope it's good. I think it is. It's to do with this hunger for C.S. Lewis. And do you know what I think it's about? When Lewis was, during the war, C.S. Lewis was asked by the BBC to talk about Christianity right. uh, on radio. And people were getting blown up by Hitler's bombs. It was... Uh, you, our own um, mortality was being called into question every day. Mrs. McCafferty down the road had got blown up. Your Uncle Archie had been killed in the war. by. So everyone was looking suddenly at the reality of life and death. And he was hugely successful. In, in London, we talk about a pub. London pubs would apparently shout, quiet, everybody, Mr. Lewis is on the radio. And the whole of the pub would be quiet, suck wow. their beer to Mr. Lewis telling you about heaven, which was incredible. Since the Blitz... Since that bombing time back in the 40s, when has it happened since this sudden intimation of immortality, this sudden realizing death is beyond and we aren't just meant to be consumers with two and a half cars in the garage? When did it happen since? COVID is when it happened since. Hmm. People look at Mrs. McCavity isn't getting blown up by Hitler. She's dying of COVID. We're really seeing an awful lot of people over here dying unexpectedly. And I think people have got that in their minds now. And so C.S. Lewis, his words from the 1940s Blitz are so relevant to people today. That's what I put it down to. The man talks sense. He talks it with, with reality. You can understand what he means. And he's talking about something that's going to happen to all of us. What happens next? Right. Well, and those those radio broadca broadcasts were then kind of coalesced into mere Christianity, which I think yeah. is one of the the pillars and one of the cornerstones of non-biblical Christian books that every man should read, every person should read. And he's able to put things in a way like I, I can remember things from that book just in conversation with people where it's like, you know, a world full of automatons is not a world worth creating. Like and that's where you get this dichotomy between good and evil and the, the capability uh, of being right. able to love and those different things. But I guess the thing that I, I'm curious about, Norman, and you've, you've talked about it a little bit here, you know, as you talked a little bit about the film and yeah, of course it was hard making it during the pandemic, but I remember whenever I was in, uh, was it, uh, Stratford on Avon where, uh, William Shakespeare is from, uh, this was, you know, years ago when I was in college, it, there was a weight just standing outside the man's home and like, I don't want it to seem like I was worshiping him or any of those types of things, but there was a reverence that I felt even after all these years, because of 
like I'm using words that wouldn't exist if he didn't exist, right? I, I'm talking about things and I'm I'm talking about narratives and stories that wouldn't even be yeah. in my brain because we wouldn't even know the whole world was different. Now with C.S. Lewis, it's probably not nearly as big of an impact as perhaps William Shakespeare, but even after all these years, Norman, C.S. Lewis is still so interesting to people. It, it's almost like I remember being in high school, figuring out who Johnny Cash was hey. and going back and listening to 40 year old records with with this this voice and this this passion and the all black and everything and like I just remember that being an overwhelming thing for me. That's what young Christians today are getting from a guy that hasn't written anything down for almost a hundred years. Help me explain why that is so enticing to people. Well, it's the footprints are still there, hmm. it, especially when you go to location. When you go to the kilns, which is a his home, is a little cottage called the kilns. And the people have done it up have done it exactly as it was in the 40s. And people live there and study there. But you go in, it isn't like a museum. There's a smell of baking coming from the kitchen. There's um, the same place, the same seat, the same desk. It, it's, mm. you just, it knocks it home really, you know, sensorily, it, it knocks it really home to you. And when somebody has done something, not just a horror writer or a comedian, or when he's done something that means something on the big scoreboard of life, and he has, and he does, and he's relevant, it just becomes a big whammy. You can, we have a throwaway society, and I'm told that kids these days only have their uh, attention span of about uh, four minutes or something before they go on to the next TikTok. Fine. He gets you in two seconds, <laughs> and certainly yeah. in four minutes. But you want to take it more. I'm fascinated that you found that and you picked him up and went with him and so on. He pays back because he's telling truth. And you don't get that much these days either. What a mess we're in. And he tells truth that matters for eternity. And he's not a preacher. He is a thinker, a Christian, and a very good writer. And I just want to make very good films about that guy. I don't want to do them more. I want to do other people too. But I've linked with him and, and connected with that um, his voice, his timbre, his thinking, his gift that he left behind. You know, right now, how many books do you think he sold? Oh, gosh, a quarter of a billion, maybe? Like yeah. tens, tens of millions. Over a quarter billions. of a billion. That's a B in there, folks. Over a wow. quarter of a billion. And it's still selling more every year. Why? Right. It, it, it's not an accident. The guy is actually has got things to say right now. And that's why I think this film, and hopefully – growing into a trilogy will go through all his life and you'll see that very much i'm not a c.s lewis worshiper i don't think he should be in stained glass windows in churches he was a human being like all of us but my goodness he touches the nerve but norman that's the point though is he's a human being like all of us and yet he's also exceptional at the same time. And, and the thing is, is the film is fantastic, guys. It'll be in the show notes. You can click on it. You've got to watch this film. And I, I really do hope it goes into a trilogy. But that's the thing about C.S. Lewis is he's accessible, but he's a little bit beyond you. And so I've read certain passages and I'm like, wow, I think I'm too dumb to understand what C.S. is trying to tell me in this exact moment. But then you read it again and you think about it and you chew on it. Because here's the thing. There are things that are like a blip on the radar. So you and I were talking about Scotch off air. One of the reasons why I like Lagavulin so much, why I like Isla Scotch so much, is because they linger on the palate. Yes. Right, you, you can taste them again later on that day. And I'm not talking about burping it up. I'm saying you can still taste it on your tongue and your gums. But then there are whiskeys and there are scotches certainly out there that as soon as you swallow them, it disappears. The palate disappears. Oh, it doesn't have a long finish. And But that peat will stay on your tongue. The smoke will stay on your tongue. It's the same thing with his writings. Is it sticky? It just kind of stays <laughs> on you, right? It's, it, does that make sense? Yeah, you're very good. I'll interview you. What else have you got to say today? <laughs> hey, no, like I, I, I do think that it's it's very, very important uh, to to kind of look at that and understand that. But one thing that I'm curious for you, being an aficionado, not a worshiper of C.S. Lewis, is if you had to delete the entirety of C.S. Lewis's catalog of writings, except for one, right? So if you had to leave one book for humanity, <laughs> which book would it be and why? Yes, I'm going to make you pick a favorite kid here, but I think that that's a very important thing to reckon with. Which one would it be? Without a hesitation, a grief observed. Okay, tell me why. That is, I'll set the context in a sentence. Um, right. When his wife died of cancer, his mother died of cancer when he was nine. He fell in love with this other woman. He married her late in life. Um, she got cancer. 
they prayed hard and did all this sort of stuff and and she got better hey and then she got cancer and died painfully mm. and he went into such a real dip talking about earning the right to be heard he went deep and he eventually pulled out of that and he wrote a book which is so searingly honest and strangely because it isn't particularly you know full of in full of uh, positivity and stuff at all, really. But he told the truth in those depths. And in the end, you think, well, all the other books are great. Yes, 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 yes. But this, I've never come across one the same. He talks about the reality of grief and the way that uh, ultimately he doesn't push it. Uh, you see, he's, he gets his faith back. I, w I met somebody um, many years ago when I was doing Shadowlands, dead now. But this lady had known his wife, Joy Davidman, and him. And I said, in the end, did he get over it? He's so real about grief in that book. And uh, she said, oh, yes, in the end, you know, he was stronger than ever. And then she leant forward and she said, but do you know, you could always see the scars, always mm. see the scars that mm. gave me Shadowlands. And it's one of those moments where he isn't cheap. He tells the truth. And I think that book has probably helped more people desperate people in the in the, the bowels of hell as it were of grief um i think he's probably that's the one that that helps people most so leave to the world something from a man who was a christian who went through hell and back and earned that right to be heard and even norman it reminds me of you know david in the psalms like you know he he's lamenting but where does he end up right he certainly had his scars uh you know physical spiritual mental scars the whole nine so that's almost like you know cs lewis's psalm if you want to kind of put it that way so you you mentioned that this could potentially turn into a trilogy so i guess when will we know if that is the plan if that's going to happen and then i am also curious what are you working on now what's the world going to get from uh, from norman here in the near future well, I want to do a film about child prostitution in Victorian England, uh, which okay. I've been working on for 37 years. You've got to be patient in this business. And I'm hoping to do that after the next two films. You say what I'm working on now. Um, I'm about to sign the contract to do the next two films of the trilogy. And this afternoon, I've been working on it for the first real time with a co-writer mm -hmm. I work with in New York uh, on, on Zoom. The, it is going to happen. I can tell you that now. I couldn't a week ago but I can now tell you it is going to happen. We're going to do his middle years, which take in those blitz days in the in London, mm -hmm. which take in him on the BBC and take in everything between him becoming a Christian in 1931 through to, I guess, 1950s, just as he's about to meet Joy Davidman. And then the, the next and last one is much more of a different story. It's a relational story between him and Joy. Uh, I did the original Shadowlands, as I say. This is slightly different from that, but deals with the same subject, and we follow through till he himself dies. And we're using the same fun technique that I stole from Charles Dickens to do the first one, where he's commenting on his own life, actually in frame, mm -hmm. and visiting the same memories, which are part of the scenery that we see. All that fun stuff, which, which really worked. And we're carrying that through the, the uh, middle one and the last one. So... Uh, it's going to take up to two years to get right, but it, we'll, we'll do it. And then hopefully I'll get onto this this rather dark but successful one. There were three Christians in 1885 that decided enough was enough. And uh, the child prostitution and the completely out of control um, system of evil and, and uh, yeah, child trafficking uh, was, was, was going out of hand. And they, they brought the government down to stop it save kids for a, at least a hundred years and now it all has gone haywire again and we're now in worse than ever situations i want to blow a trumpet that's what i want to do it's a great story never been told well i certainly hope you get that story told i know that you know at an undaunted life we equip men to push back darkness a lot of men don't know about that kind of darkness they don't know about the depravity that people have experienced in the past and certainly the depravity that is continuing to go on right now so uh, i i know that we're, we're running short on time so i'll make this the last question of the day and it's it's a bit you know unfair to ask you such a big question at the very very end but it's something that i wrote down from the very beginning because you, you tripped something in my brain christianity in the uk uh we love to lament in the united states you know how oh we're a post-christian culture and look at all this craziness and look at the wokeness and look at the government taking over yeah yeah the UK was, you know, years, if not decades ahead of the United States in terms of some of those things. And when you talk to people that are over there in the UK, it does seem to be a post-Christian culture. It becomes very odd to find someone. I remember when I lived in New York City, when you found another Christian, it's like, oh my gosh, I found the other one. 
in a city of millions and millions of people, right? It, it's just an odd thing. Talk to me a little bit about that because you, you seem to be a devout Christian. You're obviously working on things that have a Christian bend and a Christian focus, but how does that work in the UK when it seems like that's not really uh, been a thing for a while? Yeah, I am a believing Christian. It's central of my life. Um, I think... I mean, you know, every you keep thinking everything's this or everything's that, and then another generation comes up and it's different again. I, I think, you know, early days when Roman Empire was around and when Jesus Christ himself was around, and then after that, the early church, that was a pre-Christian culture. Who'd have right. thought that that strange little story would take over the world? And then you think, oh, that's going well, and then you realize Constantine, the, the emperor, wants to take it on more politically than anything else and becomes a, the church becomes the big thing. And all the way through, mess it gets messed up, messed up, messed up. What doesn't get messed up is Jesus. What doesn't get messed up is God. What doesn't get messed up is the truth. I cannot emphasize that word any more than I can, and that's massive. If we aim for the truth and we look Christ in the eyes and say, I'll follow you, Anything is possible. I frankly don't mind if it's a post-Christian, pre-Christian, whatever uh, society. If I've got a job to do here and I enjoy it, it is enjoyable. It's terrible, isn't it? You know, it, we should all be perhaps singing happy, clappy songs and, and the whole world is, is together. Well, not yet it ain't. Not yet it ain't. So we've got to roll up our sleeves and get going. And it's a fan. I discovered at college, at a very trendy art college film school, the Royal College of Art, I discovered that all these other people, everything from Marxists through to wherever, well, had their thing to say. And I was a Christian. So, and, I, and I'm a cheery sort of chap, and I'd argue back. And I remember seeing their faces. I mean, this is just a thing. It happened to me. Uh, the cloud over and doubt come in on no one had challenged back to the, you know, um, antique Marcus that was in our contemporary leftist from the left bank in. Paris and all that stuff, it, it dissolves. Truth does not dissolve. And I honestly say after my, so far, many years and hopefully many more in this, in, in this world, that, that it does not dissolve and that's the source of it. So I'm hoping, I always do, that it will be a pre-Christian age again because what happens is people, what was it Lenin said? He said, uh, we've dealt with the kings of the earth, now we must deal with the kings of the skies. Hmm. And and try to get rid of everything, and I feel like saying, so how is that going? By the way, <laughs> <laughs> it isn't going that well, and we aren't big enough to sit on the throne of God. And yet, you'll tell you that, and you trip over, you get a bloody nose, you work out. Look at the mess that we're in at the moment. I'm not saying there are political solutions, for this, but I do know there is truth, and I do there is more. Know there's more than this, and I do know that we're meant to be making this place better and help other people and all the stuff that you know as a Christian yourself. It isn't just turning up at church and wearing white shoes and a smile and putting half a dollar in the collection plate. It isn't. It's, it's nothing to do with that. It's a relationship with God through Christ. And that works. That absolutely works. Even Eric Clapton would tell you that. Yeah, absolutely. He would. That, that is a tremendous place to leave it. I really appreciate that word, but that's all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? Um, probably how to cook the next meal. I've got family coming around for a big meal, so I'm going to go and throw a chicken in the oven and do some other stuff. But that's, Sounds I've enjoyed this immensely. Thank you very, very much. All right, Norman Stone, thank you for coming on Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. My pleasure. Like a That's right. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed my time with Norman Stone. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So the only link I've got for you today is the movie, the film, The Most Reluctant Convert, The Untold Story of C.S. Lewis. Go to the website, guys. Check this movie out. Watch it with your family. It is a great, great film. Well worth your time. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening to the show. We do appreciate it. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. Life. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Cutting the Tides, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>